my name is Phil DiCollegero. I'm the executive director of the Amesbury Chamber of Commerce. And um, this is the first um, part of our Merrimack business series, um, something that we kicked off back in 2020. Um, this is the first one for 2021, where we've invited State Representative Lenny Mira to meet with members of the Merrimack business community and the, the overall community, something that he's always willing to do, but something that we at the Amesbury Chamber felt is important because you know, Merrimack and Amesbury have a very strong um, shared history. Um, our business, our people, not just in the past, but present and in the future, you know, really do rely on each other. And I think that the, the future especially is pretty tightly tied. And so it's important to us for the Merrimack um, business community that are members of the chamber, and even those that aren't members, um, to get access to the information. And um, who better than Representative Miro, who's a wealth of information and, and is somebody who's always willing, again, to help us get that information out there. This is something that we started again last year, and it's a program that was um, really spearheaded, not by the chamber as much as it was by one of our members, Heather um, Hull Colby from Webster First Federal Credit Union. Um, she's a vice president of business development there and has spent decades um, as an Amesbury resident, but also as you know, a pillar of the Merrimack business community to help try and connect people here at Merrimack with resources that they could use to help make their businesses more profitable and successful. Um, Heather. Thank you for helping organize today. Well, hello and welcome to the Merrimack Business Series and thank you for attending. I'm glad this is recorded because I know there's a few people that were going to come on and I don't see them yet. So I'm Heather Hall Colby, business developer for Webster First Federal Credit Union, as Phil said, and on this call with me today is Jennifer Boisel. She's our Merrimack branch manager, as well as Deidre Festa, who's vice president of branch administration of our Boston region. Thank you again, Phil, for working so hard to make this event possible. I'm just so passionate about those small businesses around here and what they mean to the community. Thank you, Lenny, for making yourself available today. This is a great opportunity for our local businesses to connect with you and communicate the support that they need. Small businesses, as you know, are, are the lifeblood of our local economies. When local businesses grow, our communities prosper. And you've done such an amazing job through this pandemic. And you've done this by showing great strength, determination, and tenacity. I've really witnessed you being with, um, nimble and watched you adapt quickly. And you've displayed impressive levels of creativity, adaptability as you've shifted to new operating models, distributing channels and technologies. And we at Webster First, part of our 2021 goals are to provide you with the means to continue to recover, to continue to grow through reinvention, and we are just dying to celebrate the resurgence like the Roaring Twenties. I'm honored to introduce you to Richard Lodge today, who is the editor of the Daily News, and he will be our moderator today. So Richard, I hand this meeting over to you. Thank you very much, Heather, um, and welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to uh, join the Amesbury Chamber and all of you folks here for this session where we're gonna uh, hear from Representative Lenny Mara. Uh, Representative Mira, as everybody knows, I think represents the second Essex district in the Massachusetts house. Uh, he represents uh, all or part of seven communities, I believe, including Merrimack. Uh, resident of Georgetown, I believe he formerly uh, lived in West Newburgh as well. Yes. Um, and Lenny, please correct me if, I may, if I'm wrong on some of these, but uh, you're a member of the joint committee on on community development and small business. Yep. Which I think be very relevant today. Uh, the Joint Committee on Telecom, Utilities and Energy. Yes. And the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing. That is correct, yes. All right, all complicated uh, subject areas, I think. Um, you know, let me, let me just start off and I wanna, I really do want to encourage folks um, to ask questions as we go along, to use the chat function if you wanna ask questions or uh, at the end, if you want to bring things up as well. Um, let's talk a minute about the vaccine rollout. And uh, I think initially, uh, especially when people were trying to get registered to get signed up, those who were eligible, um, a lot of challenges with the state's registration system. 
um, I think things have improved. Um, and, and I'm just kind of looking what what's your take at this point on how the rollout's going and how people are, are, are they embracing it? Are they taking advantage of vaccination sites when they can? Or yeah. what are you hearing? Great question, Richard, because it's a, um, an issue that was on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. We got uncountable phone calls, emails, letters, and personal interactions uh, from people that um, expressed a lot about frustration at the initial rollout of the vaccine. It, you know, to put it bluntly, Richard, we botched it. It just didn't get rolled out well at all. Um, it's a complicated thing anyways, but other states seem to have done a much better job at the uh, onset. So we border New Hampshire and people in New Hampshire were, were uh, pretty easily able to sign up for and get an appointment for a vaccine. Uh, whereas our website was bunched up, crashing, um, and just not being able to respond to uh, the vast amount of requests uh, for a vaccine. Now we did finally fix that. We came up with a new um, vaccine website where you can sign up. And by all accounts, this one works a lot better than the previous one. Uh, so that's the good news. The other part of your question you know, with regards to uh, people getting the vaccine. Yeah, the overwhelming response is the vast majority of people do want to get a vaccine. They absolutely do. Um, if anything, there were complaints about not being able to get it fast enough. Um, you know, we phased it in uh, in a way that the governor felt was um, most responsive and, and most fair. And so we wanted to protect first responders. We wanted to make sure people in the healthcare industry um, got their vaccines early. But then, you know, that expanded to people who are senior citizens, people with comorbidities. Um, so that's happening. And uh, as we enter into April, that's the last phase. That's when the general public will be able to sign up for a vaccine. So uh, it started off pretty poorly, uh, but it got a lot better. And now the records show that we're doing a pretty efficient job at administering the vaccine with very little waste. Um, we know we're not losing a lot of vaccines. Uh, a very high percentage of the vaccines are getting used uh, and they're getting used uh, effectively. Yeah, I mean, I've uh, just heard lately the, the Amesbury High School, the regional vaccine clinics have actually gotten more doses out of each vial than yeah. had been predicted. So 103% doses or something like that. Right. You must have, um, I know constituent service is such an important part of being a state representative. And this past year plus has been monumental in the changes that are brought to how you do your job. How did you, with, with constituents calling you at the beginning of the pandemic, and then going through the year, how did the, the requests and, and, and the concerns change in terms of what people were calling you about? Did they, oh, I mean, I, did businesses right away when business were closed, were they the ones, you know, breaking down your door, kind of figuratively speaking, or was it individuals who were concerned? Oh, absolutely. It was both. And I'm glad you brought it up. Um, you see my legislative aide here, Megan Desartels, she has spent most of the past year dealing with exactly that. Um, so it started off with businesses because, um, you know, through no fault of their own, they were shut down, Richard. I mean, they didn't do anything wrong. Government shut them down, said you can't operate. And it was mostly um, restaurants, but also busing companies, all sorts of transportation companies. Um, you know, they were furious and they were frantic. And how can you blame them? Because this is their livelihood. That's how they make a living. And we shut them down. So the beginning of the calls dealt with a lot of... Um, questions on how to get PPP loans, pandemic um, relief loans, so that those grants could, um, you know, those loans could be turned into grants so they don't have to be paid back. And then we just passed the bill, uh, making sure that they don't have to get taxed on that as well. But a lot of the calls, I would say most of the calls were from individuals that were having a hard time uh, signing up for unemployment benefits. Once again, through no fault of their own, uh, they were thrown out of a job. And so government had an obligation to take care of them. We did. Uh, the feds helped out quite a bit by adding extra money on top of unemployment benefits. Um, but our website, just like with that vaccine website, it, it, it broke down, Richard. It just didn't work well at first. It was overloaded and it, um, it was shut down. So that's coming around now, finally. Uh, but Megan, like I said, has spent most of the past year uh, helping constituents uh, be able to sign up for their benefits. And on top of all that, there was an issue with uh, a fraud where these fraudsters would try to steal your identity so that they could collect your unemployment benefits. And uh, that's a huge problem because people were not able to get their benefits, they were afraid of getting taxed on it, on benefits they never received. 
Um, so it's it's been difficult. It's been a tough slog, make no mistake about it. But um, every state rep, every state senator has had to deal with this. And, and thankfully we have contacts and unemployment uh, where we can help those constituents. So uh, if anyone else is still having these issues, uh, by all means contact us. Uh, yeah, talk, you mentioned, I think the, the House Bill 89, which was a financial relief for small businesses. Um, what, what, you know, give us an update on what's happened in the legislature in the last few weeks um, to help small businesses in particular in terms of uh, unemployment insurance uh, increases or were not, things like that. Yeah, um, there was a deadline for people to file their taxes and we hadn't even issued guidance on it. They didn't know if they were supposed to be paying taxes on certain amounts of money that they got from the feds and from the state. Uh, finally, we did uh, have a formal session where we did vote to coincide with the federal regulations on that um, so that they knew what they were taxed on, what they were not taxed on. And the same applied to unemployment benefits as well, Richard, um, where there was some confusion about which benefits would get taxed and uh, to what level and what groups would. Uh, so that did deal with that. And in the background of all this, don't forget, we have, you know, we have federal intervention. Uh, there was the, uh, the ARP, the American Rescue Plan, uh, which I think is gonna be very, very beneficial for the Commonwealth. And our small businesses would be happy to hear this. Um, you know, we're receiving enough benefits from that plan that we're hoping that we can open our schools despite a huge amount of money needed to do that. Um, we'll be able to open our schools and, and, and fund the reopenings um, without a drastic increase in, in real estate taxes because that American Rescue Plan has over 120 billion just for school reopenings, uh, plus an additional 350 billion uh, to go to states and uh, municipalities uh, to help deal with the repercussions of the uh, pandemic. And so because we're getting that money, we're able to plug holes in our budget. We thought we were gonna get bludgeoned. We thought there'd be a huge fall off of revenue. We thought that uh, we were gonna have to cut certain services and benefits. And fingers crossed, hopefully that's not going to happen now because we got those benefits and because um, tax revenues in Massachusetts came in higher than expected, if you can believe it. Uh, I think it just shows how resilient the Massachusetts economy really is. Um, our tax revenues did not fall off nearly as much as we anticipated. So that's good news. Um, so we're going to be able to open our schools, we're going to be able to help small businesses, and we'll be able to do this uh, without a, 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 an across-the-board tax increase at the state level and hopefully without... Uh, large increases in our local real estate taxes. So, and the, the rescue plan, there's some limitations on how cities and towns can use the money, but it's kind of open-ended, isn't it? In, in a lot of ways. It is, that is correct. I mean, you can't use it for tax cuts. Uh, that's not what the purpose of it is for. It's to help us rebound from this pandemic, uh, to help deal with the shutdowns that we've uh, been dealing with. Uh, there are child tax credits in there as well for uh, working families. Um, and we're trying to transition so we can get kids back in school. And don't forget, um, when kids go to school, that makes it easier for parents to go to work because uh, we're still hearing a lot of uh, complaints and issues from employers who are having a hard time hiring. Even though we have a lot of people out of work, um, they're still having a hard time hiring. And it's across the board. It's not just skill positions. It's not just healthcare and jobs requiring a degree. It's also uh, restaurants, retailers. Um, they're having a hard time. And it's all part of the same picture, Richard, because you know, we need schools to be open so that these kids can be in, in classroom in person, which is very much needed, but also so parents can get themselves to work. Um, so, I, you know, I think the feds have finally come around uh, to listening to state and local government officials saying, you know, we got to work together on this. We got to be on the same page because we all benefit um, when we can get kids back in school and people back in jobs. Yeah, I was frankly a little uh, surprised that daycare workers you know, employees of daycare centers weren't considered essential employees, and yet they, they really were. I mean, you had to have daycare centers open if possible so that essential workers at hospitals and, you know, could go to do their jobs early in the pandemic. Um, so now, you know, along those lines, uh, how do you feel about should all teachers be vaccinated before everybody's back in school? What's your, what are your thoughts on that? Because and what, what are your thoughts on everybody being back in school next week? Yeah, I, I want to see them back in school as soon as possible. Uh, we got countless phone calls and e emails from parents furious that, you know, it has taken so long. Um, you know, we had some requirements for starting back in school. 
teachers, uh, the unions especially said that, you know, we want to make sure the ventilation systems are up and operational and that we can have proper spacing. And some schools did that. I think Triton spent, goodness, about a quarter of a million dollars upgrading their ventilation, but then it still wasn't good enough. So now they're saying they want everyone vaccinated, but uh, we want to see that happen. The problem is there's only a limited number of vaccines. Um, you know, we're stifled in that Massachusetts only gets a certain allotment. It's not like we have, you know, 7 million vaccines for 7 million people. It doesn't work that way. They're coming in in stages and we have to administer them accordingly. And so um, to answer your question, yeah, I wanna see the schools opened up. It's, it's, it's not good for anyone to have kids remain at home. Every doctor, every pediatrician we talked to, every specialist we talked to said, this is not good for young children. Um, we're social creatures. We need to be in a, uh, a social environment. And having a kid sit behind a laptop all day trying to do a schoolwork is not healthy. It's not effective. Uh, I think we're going to be way behind or where we should be with education because, you know, at home education just doesn't measure up. It just doesn't compare to in-person classroom ed education. So, um, yeah, I want to see them back in the classroom. Absolutely. Yeah, the dynamics are definitely a lot different when you're at home. Um, in terms of I know that uh, employers are having, some of them are having a hard time filling positions, but I think there also will be, and there are people who have permanently lost their jobs because they're, the business that employed them is, has either permanently cut back or maybe it's closed. Um, what, what do we do with those folks? How do we help them in terms of retraining programs, uh, uh, counseling, you know, job counseling, maybe working with community colleges to help with retraining? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, all of those things uh, would be helpful. Absolutely. Um, but uh, in addition to that American Rescue Plan that I just talked about, on the heels of that will be what I think is going to be a very substantial infrastructure bill, uh, which is going to see a lot of money to every state, including this one, uh, for some infrastructure repairs that uh, very much needed. We've been kicking this can down the road for a lot of years. The last several presidents simply just couldn't get it done. And hopefully um, we'll coalesce around this one who said that we're going to go big on this. Um, we're not talking billions anymore, Richard. We're talking trillions with a T. And so that's going to create a lot of jobs and necessary jobs too. And remember, it's not just roads and bridges. It's also things like water and sewer systems, something that we've been advocating for for a long time. And thanks to your newspaper, there's a lot of attention now on things like combined sewage overflows. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've been going on for 50 years. It's always been that way. That's how the source systems were designed. Uh, but thanks to a lot of really good writers at your paper, it was brought to the public's attention. And now we're finally getting around to doing something about it. And so the local state reps and senators are working with our congressional delegation to make sure that there is money in that infrastructure bill for things like water and sewer systems. I mean, these things need to be upgraded anyways, um, in addition to dumping raw sewage into the river. Um, you know, there are issues with, you know, very old pipes delivering drinking water to our homes. It's something we should never take for granted. Um, so getting back to jobs, you know, this is something that I think would help a lot. Um, it's not as easily, it's not as easy as just spending that money in infrastructure. We, we do need that training that you mentioned. Uh, but fortunately, we do have some community colleges uh, NECO, Northern Essex Community College, uh, has been outstanding with that. We talked to Lane Glenn every month or so, and um, he's got cutting edge information on that. And he shows how the, the top 10 jobs that are in most demands now uh, are crucial fulfilling. And eight of them didn't exist just a few years ago. I mean, that's how rapidly our economy is changing and we need to change with it. Yeah, that's uh, how technology has gotten so deeply ingrained in our lives too. You mentioned the CSO uh, issue, and, and I know you were a, a big proponent of the CSO notification bill, uh, a very important major first step. And I know that the Watershed Association is, is starting a long-term water quality study in the Merrimack River. Um, and it's interesting to think about some of the federal dollars because of the pandemic, possibly helping to upgrade uh, sewer and water, you know, systems, stormwater systems. Um, but so who's going to champion that? Because we know it's going to cost billions of dollars in coming years. A lot of it has to be federal money. Um, in terms of the Merrimack, it involved New Hampshire and Massachusetts. So you have that cross-border 
cooperation, but who, who are the champions of this to get the money, to get it done? So we're not talking about the same thing in 20 years. You know? Right. No, it's, it's going to take the cooperation. Like you said, that river begins way up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. So we need that state on board with advocating for these dollars. Um, fortunately, Lori Trahan, uh, the rep who has the Merrimack in her river, it just goes right down the middle of her district. Um, she has made this a priority for a long time now. And that has been very, very helpful. And now I see that Rep. Seth Moulton uh, also has a bill on this, the Stop CSO bill. Um, so I think we're going to see it happen. Uh, Massachusetts has quite a few members on that transportation committee, um, including some of the uh, chairs and assistant chairs. And I think that's going to translate into these funds finally coming here, Richard, um, because it is going to take a monumental effort. And, and the other thing is, it's, it's not like, one thing that has to be fixed. It's not like we just fixed the sewage plant itself mm -hmm. and it goes away. Those sewage outfalls occur in various locations. Um, you know, Havel may have a dozen different locations. Um, so each street will have to have repairs and upgrades uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen again. It, it's gonna take a lot of effort. Um, there's only five cities that are really doing it. You know, two in New Hampshire, Nashua and Manchester. Then you get into Massachusetts, it's Lowell, Lawrence, and then finally Havel. Um, those are big cities, they're old cities. Um, so we have to dig up very old streets uh, to replace some um, infrastructure so that this doesn't continually occur. Uh, but as far as who's gonna spearhead it, um, the notification system, I think we'll go through our Massachusetts DEP. I think that's where residents will be able to find out about when it's safe to go back in the water. Um, but as far as carrying out the uh, repairs, we're gonna lean on our federal delegation to make sure Sure that they advocate for this. Um, you know, the good news is this is one of those rare occasions where all sides are in agreement, Richard. Um, you know, it's not just the blue team, red team thing. We all want to clean up that river. So Jim Kalkos and I have the um, part of the, we're at the end of the district. Everything that gets dumped upstream ends up in our district in the Merrimack. And we have a good working relationship with Governor Baker. We make sure that we are in his face and this is in his ear on a regular basis so he knows how important this is. At the same time, uh, Representative Linda Dean Campbell has a good working relationship with both this speaker and the last speaker. So she got along pretty well with Speaker DeLeo, and now she's also um, very close to Speaker Mariano. And she's going to make sure that this stays in their ears as well, uh, because we need the multiple levels of government all on the same page here. It starts with the feds, uh, but when that money finally comes here, you know we want to make sure it's properly spent. You'll recall there was a stimulus bill passed, um, geez, way back in 2010. Um, the Obama administration did put forth a stimulus bill that was supposed to go to infrastructure. And for some reason, a lot of it just did not make it to infrastructure. And you heard that term that, you know, we didn't have enough shovel ready jobs. Well, I don't want that to happen this time. I want to make sure that these jobs are shovel ready so that when the money shows up, we'll actually get the repairs done. Yeah, good point. I, and we all know that some of the shovel-ready jobs are the roads and bridges of Massachusetts, uh, yeah. Yeah. which in many cases are crumbling and way past the point where they should have been replaced. Big time. Oh, yeah. Um, red team and blue team. And what about the Pentucket green team? You know, that's the... <laughs> We're um, all green when it comes to that river. We all are, believe me. Um, everyone wants to see it cleaned up. Keep in mind, Richard, you know, that's a source of, of recreation and tourism. Uh, it's a big part of our economy. So these small business people that are on our in our Chamber of Commerce, you know, will be interested to know that it, it helps us all if that river gets cleaned up. And, and it's funny that we bring this up now. My earlier Zoom call this morning was with the Coastal Caucus. So the state reps and state senators on the coast meet on a regular basis. And today's lecture was from a group from the shellfish industry, okay? Mm -hmm. And so we have some of the best seafood in the world. Not to brag, but Massachusetts does. We've got good cold water. <clears throat> but in order for our shellfish to be sold in other states and other countries, we have to com comply with certain safety and cleanliness and environmental regulations. And if we don't mm -hmm. comply with those environmental regulations, we're not going to be allowed to sell our oysters and our mussels to other states or other countries. And this is a huge industry. It's a chance for Massachusetts to bring in money from other states and other countries something that benefits our economy across the board. And of course they taste delicious, we all love them. Um, but that's why, you know, it, it's not red or blue. It, it's something that would benefit all of us. So we need to comply with these safety and environmental regulations 
so that our economy can thrive. It'll benefit us all. Yeah, a very good, very good point. Um, speaking of uh, Governor Baker, um, there's um, Senator DeZoglio is uh, proposing a bill, and I know others are as well, to, to sort of start, um, you know, when the pandemic began, the governor logically and rightfully declared a state of emergency and imposed a lot of restrictions on all of us. And uh, businesses had to shut down schools, you know, mask mandates. Um, and he, for the first few months, he was having almost daily press conferences with really were amazing briefings of what was going on in our in our state. Um, is it time to to get more oversight? You know, should the legislature now put some things in place to get the governor to back off, or at least to have you know a sixty day period in which he might have to come before both the House and the Senate to get um, an extension, for example, of, of one of his executive powers? Uh, or should he just continue the way he's doing it? What do yeah, you think? that's a great question. And, and the short answer is yes, Richard. Um, we do need to revisit this. The the rules and laws he were operating that he was operating under, I think, were written during the Cold War when we were fearing <laughs> some sort of yeah. nuclear annihilation, a, an extreme event where we needed a governor to be able to commandeer buildings, vehicles, shut down companies, you know, in, in a very extreme um, in, condition or environment. And so people were questioning, does a pandemic fit that description? It's different from a terrorist attack or a nuclear war. It's very different. Um, so to answer your question, I'm going to say, yeah, we do need to revisit these laws. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan and friend of Governor Baker, but, you know, he's not going to be governor forever. And what do we want the next governor to be able to uh, do if a pandemic occurs again? Well, I think we, sh we should do what you brought up, Richard. I think that for some instances, some rules and regulations, they should go to the legislature. That didn't happen this time around. Uh, we were not informed or uh, or asked to vote on things like shutting down our school system or mm -hmm. shutting down private businesses or restricting indoor dining. Um, these were all executive orders. And, and so, like I said, uh, we were operating under a set of rules that were created during the Cold War for an extreme event. Um, and I think there should be another set of rules uh, that should be in play for something like a pandemic. Um, you know, personal responsibilities and personal rights, I think, um, need to be respected a little bit more. And yeah, I would like to see the legislature more involved in these decisions going forward, because we, we really weren't this time around. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, yeah, back on the local level, uh, if you can talk for a minute about, um, you know, what, is, what are some of the challenges facing Merrimack and, and the other towns you represent? Merrimack in particular, you know, the uh, local businesses there, you know, what are they up against? How are you working with them to get everybody back on their feet, for example? Yeah, this should be front and center starting right now. As the pandemic comes to an end, as people are getting vaccinated, we want to get businesses up and running again. So I met with the selectmen in mm -hmm. Merrimack, um, and we got a great group of guys there. We've got a town hall full of great people that are easily accessible and always available to talk. And I want to get with them on look at, let's get to the nuts and bolts. Let's, let's roll up our sleeves, get our hands dirty and figure out what we can do to make Merrimack thrive a little bit more. And I think one of the first things we should look at is maybe take an inventory of our real estate, look at our property. Um, you know, I own and manage some industrial properties down in, in the Woburn area and the demand for industrial space is just off the charts. Um, small businesses need this space and there isn't a lot of it inside 128. So they're starting to come this way, outside 128, even outside 495. And I'm talking tenants like a plumber, an electrician, a home builder, uh, a demolition guy, those kind of businesses, as well as carpet cleaning and, and uh, industrial sales, uh, they need space to operate out of. And there's not a lot of it around. So we should look at Merrimack and see what we have, because Merrimack did something smart a lot of years ago. We zoned some areas for commercial. And this helps us because it not only creates jobs for the area, Richard, um, it's also tax revenue for the town without a lot of demands on the town. So when a company moves there, when a commercial building is built, uh, it results in a good amount of tax revenue, but they're not you know, putting kids in the school system. It's not a lot of demand on town services. And so it's a benefit to the whole town. It can keep our real estate taxes under control 
um, while also making sure that town hall has the funds it needs to operate. And in the background of all this, keep in mind, it's a border town. We border New Hampshire, which has no sales tax, uh, no income taxes, uh, the cost of living, cost of housing is substantially lower. Um, you know, and, and the cost of putting up public buildings is also substantially less. I mean, um, when we built our new police station, you know, people were questioning why it cost what it did. And as our chief pointed out, in New Hampshire, it would have cost substantially less because they just don't have the expenses and regulations that we do. So this is what we're up against. And we need to get all our heads together, pulling in the same direction uh, to make sure that um, Merrimack can thrive. Thankfully, we do have a new police station. Uh, it's gorgeous. It came out beautiful. And, um, you know, we're going to look at that. And in the background of all this is also housing because there's, um, there's always a 40B project being proposed around the corner. Uh, and that's an issue that we'll also have to tackle at some point. Yeah, talk about that for a minute. I know there's one in uh, in Newbury that you had an interest in. Um, I mean, an interest in how it was, you know, whether it was appropriate and and how it was moving along. I mean, 40B is is tough on some communities. Uh, we need affordable housing everywhere, but you know, there's different ways of approaching it. Uh, 40B. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, what what how, how do we how do we deal with this? Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of 40B. You know, it allows a developer to come in and just basically ignore all our zoning rules and regulations. They can just uh, put up something that I would call very inappropriate. So we go in a, a neighborhood of single family homes, and that's what we mostly have in this area. Uh, and they can put in 180 apartment, 180 unit apartment building or condo complex, um, mm -hmm. which is not what, you know, the town was planned for. It's not how we zone. Uh, you know, people move here for a reason. We want to live in an area of single family homes. And then a developer can come in and put in one of these uh, and make huge amounts of money. Uh, um, and the cost of that falls on the municipality. Um, so if it overburdens a school system or a water and sewer system, the courts will say, um, you know, that the municipality has a responsibility to provide those things. So the developer can, will make his money. And if he needs, you know, upgraded services, it, it, that cost will fall on the town. So I have seven towns in my district and, you know, it gets proposed just about every year in one of them. And it's, it, it's very, you know, disruptive. Uh, we do need affordable housing, like you said. It's just that, you know, we want to see housing that's appropriate for a neighborhood. So in a town like Merrimack, if we have one and two family homes, you know, that is what I feel is more appropriate. Uh, but we do need housing. It is a... It is a very serious issue. Some will call it a crisis, a housing crisis, um, but 40B is not the way to do it. Another program is called 40R, which I think works a lot better, Richard. Um, Newburyport has a 40R district. It encourages housing near existing forms of public transportation, uh, which is something that I think we should be encouraging. When you put a 40B in, what typically happens is a developer comes in and wipes out an entire forest. The environment is just destroyed. And then a bunch of units get built. With 40R, we're building in a place that already has a road, water system, sewer system, and public transportation. And the state gives money to the city or town that builds the 40R. They get a certain amount of money for every unit built. And I think that's a much better deal. And to do it, the town would plan an area for the 40R to get built. Therefore, we can create where the project goes and what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope to work with our town officials, all my town officials, uh, to just to come up with ways to perhaps uh, plan for a 40R somewhere. Yeah, I think you're referring to the uh, one Boston Way over by the commuter yeah. rail station. Yeah, that's we, correct. That's correct. You folks haven't maybe haven't been to Newburyport to that part of the city lately. It's it's pretty amazing. It's a a, a pretty nice looking multi story apartment building. Uh, they're starting to 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 uh, get some tenants. I think they're not quite in yet, but people are signing up for it right near the commuter rail station. And as long as we keep that train running, we'll be, we'll be all set. Well, you know, you'll live right next to that train. And so right. residents there, Richard, can just jump on and off it. And you can walk to downtown. Yep. So it's reducing the need for automobiles, something that we'd all like to see, right? Um, right. Anyone who commutes to Boston, like I have once in a while, will know that that commute can be brutal. And reducing the number of cars on the road is something that benefits us all. So a 40 yard does that. It encourages that construction in areas that already have transportation. And that area of Newburyport, you know, let's face it, over near the traffic circle, that's an area that could use some development. Um, mm. You know, it's not a forest that's protecting, you know, a bunch of habitat. It's it's old, rundown, some industrial areas. Uh, it could use some fixing up. And people want to live in this area, and that's a perfect spot, you know. And that train 
is popular. People like using it. So, um, you know, I'm going to call it a win-win. It's right on the rail trail too. So it's a short walk oh, yeah. downtown and right down to the water. It's very nice. That's right. Yeah. Richard, could I, could I jump in for a moment? And so Brett Mira was talking prior to the, the 40B discussion, because there's, there's a lot of interest for people moving up here, which you know, we can be great because those can be consumers, they can be employees. If you're a business that wants to move up here, and maybe somebody from even the, the town departments that are on this call um, could jump in. If you were a business that wanted to move up here with either industrial space or retail space, and you wanted to come to Merrimack, where would you go? Or who would you, who would you turn to to start um, that search? You're asking me, where would they go? Uh, and I think that's tough because you're, you're, you're a state legislator. So, um, but obviously Merrimack's a smaller town. And I have to say, you guys do a lot in Merrimack for the, the smaller staff that you have. I mean, you certainly make every penny, you know, go the distance. Um, but that can also be tougher then too, right? So in, in, in Amesbury, we're a little bit larger. Some of the cities around us, of course, are larger, um, as even larger than us, and have um, full-fledged economic development departments. And so my question for you, know, for you or you know, if somebody were to call, where would you direct them? Or like I said, if somebody from, the, from town hall wanted to jump in, just because we were talking about this interest and in the growth um, of, of the Merrimack area. So if you were somebody that wanted to come up here and look specifically at the Merrimack, um, within the town borders and bring your business here, but you didn't know where to start, where do you start um, or where would you direct them? Money, I think that's for you or for, for anybody there. Are you asking for a town official, Phil, or are you asking? Are you asking yeah, so, start out, so if someone were to reach out to, reach out to you or if any of the town officials on the call wanted to to jump in and provide that that guidance, and if, they, if not, that's I understand it can be, it can be tough, again, where you're a smaller community, um, maybe the best bet is just to start with a realtor, but I was just curious because we were talking about that interest, and I agree, I hear a lot of interest from people who want to either live and or open businesses in Merrimack, which is, is pretty neat, um, because you are on the New Hampshire border, as are we in Eastbury, so right. you know, it can be a challenge. Um, so I, think the real I think the real estate brokers are, are people that should be at our table. They should be in, the, in this discussion, both the residential and the commercial brokers. Uh, because they're the ones with the fingers on the pulse. They know what the demand is for specifically um, and, and what people are looking for specifically. Um, they should be part of the conversation, you know, and we've got some good brokers in this area that could really help us, I think. Like I said, taking an inventory of our existing commercial real estate base in both Amesbury and Merrimack uh, would be helpful. And we could, you know, promote this. Uh, other cities are doing this. Big cities have the people in the means to do it. And they kind of have an advantage over us. Like last or two years ago, um, Havel did that. They actively sought out businesses. And so they went to Plum Island Kayak in Newburyport and said, hey, we got the spot on the river that would be perfect for your business. Would you consider it? And he did. And he opened up a new business location in Haverhill, uh, right downtown. And he's renting kayaks and canoes and other things uh, right there on the water. He's creating jobs and he's creating um, you know, some synergy and some and economic um, activity in an area of Haverhill that has, had long been blighted. It's fixed up now and it's, it's drawing people there. And, and, you know, everyone tries to be like Newburyport. They want a uh, waterfront like Newburyport has because it's such a success story. And that's resulting in people wanting to move to Haverhill, wanting to live there. That in turn led to developers building some really nice new housing there, uh, right on the water and just off the water. Uh, and, you know, some of the people on this call are old enough to remember we're in a time when people did not want to go to Haverhill, you know, when that part of the city was not an area that people wanted to live in. Now they do want to live there. Um, Merrimack has that same treasure. They have that uh, frontage on the river and it's beautiful. And so we should engage with our real estate brokers to see, hey, what would it take to get a Plum Island kayak to come here uh, to get another company to open up maybe another restaurant along the water? Um, it's something that if we all worked on together would go a long way to, to see more activity, I think. Sorry, um, I jumped in, Richard. I should break that. No, that's good. Um, just, just curious if folks have questions, if they have things they want to ask, you can use that chat function. And I guess I would ask, ask the representative, what have, what have we missed in this? I know there's a lot of things going on. What's, what's really on your mind these days? Um, no, I, boy, I, I wrote a bunch of notes down. I, I think we hit upon all of them. Um, 
well, now that you bring it up, Richard, you know, one thing that never, not, never got attention last session uh, was a bill to, um, to notice our, our local newspapers because it's a tough environment now for local papers, uh, something that we, we rely on a lot. I mean, there's a lot of news sources out there on the internet for national news and for foreign affairs and foreign uh, news. Um, but, you know, CNN is not going to report on what's going on in the state house. And the Boston Globe is not really going to report on what's happening in city hall or town hall. Um, we've always relied on local newspapers like the Newburyport News to do this. You know, we, we, we need someone to report on this. Um, but the industry is such that it's, it's tough for a small paper uh, to continue staying in business, you know, to pay writers to go to that planning board meeting uh, and, and a select board hearing. Um, it's very difficult. So we have a bill that's going to address that to see what we can do to keep these newspapers afloat because, um, you know, it, it gets forgotten in the, in the mix. Um, there's a, a deluge of news everywhere on the internet. That's great. But like I said, there's like a gap uh, for this local news. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do have a bill uh, in the state house to deal with that, that mm -hmm. I think is pretty interesting. And, and, you know, lastly, you know, I'm going to go off course a little bit here. Um, Merrimack has a really cool group, the Merrimack Anti-Racism Alliance, MARA, M-A-R-A. And uh, they've been meeting with me, talking to me about legislation that we can work on together to deal with racism, something that's in the forefront of a lot of people's minds. And um, I'm glad the chief is here too, because we were talking about the police department as well. Uh, so we have bills that's gonna make it um, easier for people to get a college degree and become a police officer or a law enforcement officer. Because what we found is that the officers that get a degree that are college educated um, have better reading and writing skills. They have fewer disciplinary problems. Um, they have better communication skills and they're far less likely to use deadly force. I mean, we're talking about this with the Chauvin case going on in the background, of course. Uh, and I think it's vitally important. And, you know, this is one more thing where we can all agree, where all sides agree that, um, you know, having the best trained, best educated police force in the country would be great for Massachusetts. And um, so we got a couple of bills that would help make that happen. Uh, one would provide free college tuition if you go to a community college or UMass and get a degree in law enforcement or in uh, criminal justice. I have another bill that would allow the Commonwealth to pay the student loan payments for someone who goes to work at a law enforcement agency. So if you already have that degree and you're making payments on a student loan, the Commonwealth could help a local police department hire people by helping them pay those student loan bills. Uh, and this is happening at a time when police departments are having a hard time finding, like everyone else, they're having a hard time finding help because there's an age limit. You know, once you're my age, they, they want you to retire uh, from state police and even local police. So we're trying to get more young people into that field and we're making a conscious effort to get people of color to go into that field as well. For a lot of reasons, um, they just weren't doing that. And so, especially in a big city, we want the police force to look like the population that they're policing. And so we're trying to make that happen. And there's some really great people at Mara uh, that are working with me on trying to make that happen. So just thought that was interesting. Yeah, no, that's great. That's good to hear. Uh, I mean, both of those uh, elements, the, the newspaper uh, industry, you know, is definitely struggling. Um, yeah. We, we appreciate you know, I think that to just put in a plug here for myself, the thing that can help the newspaper industry is if people understand they need to pay for the skills and the labor that goes into producing real news papers. Uh, and there's, as you said, there's a lot of a lot of noise on the internet. Um, maybe it's news, but a lot of it isn't. You know, it's just people right. being people. And then a lot of people take newspaper stories and put it on their Facebook page. And then people talk about the news, but where did they get that story originally? You know, it was done by a trained reporter and trained editors and people who do this for a living uh, and whose credibility is on the line when we do it. Um, exactly right. Yeah. Could I jump into, so the, the sure. thing that I see is so valuable about newspapers specifically like the daily news is that otherwise, where do communities like Merrimack and Amesbury actually find out what's happening in their own communities. And you said earlier about town halls and, and smaller city halls, like that is, for, for us, it's it's the beginning and the end. It's the end all be all when it comes to getting as, as unbiased and, you know, human nature, there's naturally a bias in everything, but as unbiased of a, of a report as possible on what's actually happening in your community. And we, 
you have the daily news to turn to and that's it. But it is exciting to hear that but we're getting, we're tackling that. I mean, it's been something that, you know, we've seen the slide happen with, with weekly papers, especially knowing this very at one point did have a weekly paper that, that was publishing that's no longer the case where there's a print paper. So uh, what what could we do as a as a as a community, as a business community? Because we depend on that for our own news to distribute information about what's happening. What can we do to help better educate our members about the legislation and you know what are ways that we can be supportive of making sure that this this important piece of our business community and overall community stays vibrant. Right. Yeah, I, push, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, I think I, I think people. I'm should... asking the lawmaker. I, you're, uh, you're a little but, but of course. I mean, and I and I'm glad that that you. This part of the reason why we create this program too is because we want this information to go out there, and we want you to be able to have access as as well as the newspaper. What's um? But that that legislation um is pretty exciting to hear you talk about, Representative. And I I hadn't really I heard that there were some thoughts about you know doing something. But what um what is that? Yeah, Lori Lori Ehrlich is the state rep from, I think, Marblehead. She's the one that sponsored the bill. And there was a hearing on it last session. I don't know where the bill stands this year, but I, I'm pretty sure she refiled it. Um, and they're forming a commission to just study, to figure out how to do exactly what you just talked about, Phil. Uh, we don't have all the answers. I don't think we have any answers right now, other than let's encourage small businesses to come here and encourage them to not only subscribe to the newspaper, but to advertise in it. You know, um, you know we're, we're all accustomed to seeing local attorneys, dry cleaners, car dealers advertise there. Um, but the business model is different than when, you know, we were younger and every classified ad was in your local paper, every house for sale, every apartment for rent, every car for sale, um, things of that nature. It's, it's different now. And so we need to figure out a way in this new economy uh, to help those papers survive. Like, you know, we're not gonna be able to figure out when the next 40B is being proposed without a local newspaper. We wouldn't know what those sewage overflows look like with those, you know, gross looking pictures of foam rising, uh, you know, next to people's boats, you know, the ones that Jim Sullivan wrote about two pictures of that occurred only because we have a local newspaper. So they, that wouldn't have happened without a paper. Um, so we all want to see them survive and, and thrive. Uh, we just got to figure out how to do that. So the commission is being formed right now. Um, I, I want to say there's like 15 members on the governor picks one, the House picks one, the Senate, I think the unions pick a member, and then they're going to start meeting. I think they're going to submit a report later this year, Phil. So hopefully we'll have a better answer for it later this year. Yeah, I think if I can jump in, you know, this just from the point of view of a lot of people in the industry, we're not looking at subsidies or bailout or anything. We're It's more, I think, of, uh, of, of increasing awareness of both the importance of civic education uh, and and how how our communities operate, how our societies operate, and that reliable news is part of that, and that's part of how we communicate. So I think it is, you know, I think civic education in schools is is uh, there needs to be more of it, and so that young people understand what what it means to be involved in your community and then how how to help a community work together, which I think is what Mara also is, is talking about, of people being welcoming communities, uh, people working together to make their communities better uh, and, and to make them help them thrive. And the newspaper, I think in many cases can be part of that. So that's it's all part of that discussion. So there's a lot more to go on that. I mean, it's like you say, just a committee is being set up, a lot of different people, a lot of different parties involved in it. And we'll have to see what happens with that. Phil, I'm gonna I'm gonna dish this over to you. I think we're uh, probably up against the time wall here. I don't know if you have some questions from uh, members. I think not seeing any there. I want to make sure I'm not on mute. Um, I are. think you did a really good job of funneling the questions to the representatives, and we'll put it out there. Is there any any folks on the call that have anything they'd like they'd like to ask or have Richard or myself ask? I also think the representative is very accessible. So I, I think, uh, you know, he's he's well known in the community. There are a lot of folks on the call on the Zoom have probably spoken with him and, you know, certainly uh, are, are uh, familiar with the things he's working on. So absolutely. I mean, it's funny. It's it's not representative mayor. It's Lenny because absolutely. It's Lenny. In the Please, by all means, it's Lenny mayor. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, for purposes of this call, we'll refer to you as as representative mayor. But um, it's I, I meant like the response when we were telling people it's you know we get to talk to them often but it's great to I think for a community like Merrimack 
and I'll go back to how we began this call, um, working with Webster First Federal Credit Union and working with the Daily News to help just bring more attention to that specific community because Merrimack can often get lumped in with some very large communities around it. I mean, it's, there's Haverhill to its left, Amesbury and Newburyport to the right, and it, it can just be really tough at times to talk specifically about what's happening there. And of course, you know, you share a piece of Haverhill, but you know, Amesbury and Merrimack don't have the same legislators. We're lucky that we both have you know, great ones. Um, and so it, you know, we appreciate that you allow us to create this forum where, where at least our business community has that extra access and opportunity to learn specifically about Merrimack and not just about the region, not about the Merrimack Valley, but about our community and what's happening there. So thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Mira. Thank you to Heather from Webster First Federal Credit Union, her team. And thank you, Richard, for moderating today from the Daily News of Newburyport. Um, this wasn't meant to be a plug for the Daily News, but certainly if you want to go and, and <laughs> subscribe, you can do so, um, whether it's to the print or to the digital. Um, Tell it, your friends. You know, it, it's a great resource, and we thank you. Um, thank you for doing it. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Lenny. And we'll get this edited, put up online, and you can have access to the program at your convenience. So sounds thank good. You, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Thank you. Yeah. So that and that's I'll I'll that's the end of the recording. I'll lock this part off. But I really truly though, thank you for doing that. Um, and and help us spread the information. I'm sorry, Carol. I'm messaging. I, I don't even know. Maybe Carol just jumped off. I was messaging her during it. Um, during the call, but I did. I, I ended up even losing her. So oh well. Um, <laughs> um. But I appreciate Lenny that I, I was hoping that she might be able to jump in and talk about who um, who we could reach out to if we get people who are interested. Like I have somebody who's interested in 2,500 square feet of industrial space in the area and I'm, I'm striking out over wow. in Amesbury. They want to relocate from the Chelsea Winthrop area. So, um, and I wouldn't even know where to start in, in, uh, in Merrimack. You know, I went to all my property owners in Amesbury that I had information for and, you know, that's yeah, uh, the brokers are always the best place to start. And you'll notice every area has like one or two or three brokers that kind of get most of the calls. Um, in this area, I think it might be Caldwell Banker that does a lot of commercial brokerage and um, maybe um, Minco as well. That's Lou Minicucci's firm. Uh, they do some commercial as well. Uh, but even our Re uh, residential brokers uh, will often help a business move here. It's just a different realm, different specialty. Uh, um, but, you know, perhaps that should be the next Zoom call because, um, you know, there, there really needs to be some sort of assessment or inventory of what we got available uh, for space in this area. And uh, the brokers are, are the ones that know. Um, you know, I, I'm from Wolverton, so the broker there is Carboni Real Estate, and he fills all our space. He always knows what it's going for and what kind of that people are looking for um, in this area. Um, yeah, I think Austin Spinella was one broker that was doing quite a bit of work around here. Uh, he had some listings in the Newburyport Industrial Park, um, but there are other brokers as well. And, um, you know, it's just a matter of going to maybe the website, like loopnet.com is a commercial real estate listing place where you can get a lot of brokers names and uh, they could find the space. They could even find the 2,500 square feet that is perhaps not on the market yet. And, uh, you know, that'd be helpful. That's, um, that's my go-to normally, but then I always get nervous that maybe somebody might try to, you know, you're, you're trying to find space for your client, and I obviously want to keep them within the zip codes. I don't want the, oh, well, here's another great No, we want them here. Like 10 we want them in here. In that direction. That was we don't want them going to New Hampshire. We want them right here. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. Exactly. exactly. Um, or even, I mean, yeah, like, again, I, or don't go to Havels. I mean, well, you're trying to get them to here, but, you know, Merrimack and, and, and Amesbury, that's, Right. That's the place. But um yeah, thank you for it. And thank you for being being so thank helpful. you for doing it. Anytime, say the word, I'll be there. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you know. And the, uh, the next call should be with Senator DeZoglio. We don't have that on the calendar yet, but um if there's ever any if you any of you still in the call, if you ever have any topics that you want us to tackle from Merrimack specifically, let me know. Um the edited video, I'm gonna drop in the contact info for yourself. Um Oh, that's fine. Absolutely do that. Underneath your underneath your uh your face as you speak will be your title and the, the email and the phone number for your office will pop up periodically during the call. So all right. We'll Sounds good. Soon. Um, all right. Hi right, guys. Thank Bye. you. Everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Representative. Anytime. And thank you, Phil. Thank you, Heather. Good to Have see you, Deirdre. Jennifer. Yeah. <laughs>